our tonight. This is Alia Evangelista from the Asia eHealth Information Network, and we're broadcasting live from the WHO Western Pacific Regional Office for this webinar. This is a 45 minutes to one hour session, which feature topics on eHealth, health information systems, and IT for civil registration and vital statistics. Our topic for tonight is ICOTR 14639 Capacity, Bu Capacity Based eHealth Architecture Roadmap. This webinar will educate us on how ICOTR 14639 can provide guidance to our country on the implementation and use of information and communications technology when building eHealth architectures. A proposed business reference architecture will be described based on components and capabilities needed to support various health service activities in this session. But before we start, let me orient you on a quick four items to remember in this webinar. First is our platform, how to participate, our program details, and our email feedback. We're now using Cisco WebEx Event Center. And our short link for this meeting is bitly.com slash ahinhour. Our room number is 865-704-536. And our password is Canada123. If you're having, having problems um, hearing my voice or participating in this meeting room, you can lag out the session and rejoin immediately through the short link. Your mic will be mute for the rest of our meeting, but you can actively participate in three ways, by sending your feedback to us, by chatting your response, and by posting your questions and answering our, our poll. You can send your feedback by clicking the feedback button on the right side of your screen. It's below the attendees window. It's the dialogue balloon with a check mark. And on the drop down menu, you can respond by a yes or no. Say the presentation is too fast or too slow. And you can also appreciate the speaker with an applause and send your virtual laughter. So let us try using that option by responding to my question. If you can hear my voice well, can you put a check mark or uh, after your name using that dialog box, please, please click on the dialog balloon with a check mark. So I can just check if my voice registers well to you. I see a check mark from the Ministry of Health in Myanmar and from the Ministry of Health in Maldives. Other check mark from Mark Petior, thank you. From Mohamed Buyan, thank you. From Melissa Chu, thank you. From Roberto Patio, thank you. Others, please put a check mark on the screen for your feedback. Thank you for those who are registering their feedback. For the others, we will still wait for you. Thank you. Thank you for those who have just posted their yes or their check mark. You can also chat your response by typing your message to the speaker or the panelist, the host, or both inside the meeting room. However, you cannot chat to all, as this is the default feature of the Cisco WebEx Event Center to bring order within the chat room. The panelists or speakers are the only individuals in the meeting room who can chat to everyone. And as this, we request that if you want to chat to everyone, just chat to all the panelists, and we'll just post it to our general chat box. Lastly, you can post your question by selecting the Q&A box icon. Once selected, this feature will appear at the bottom of the right panel of your screen, and you can then assign the question using the drop-down menu, Then you can use, and then you can key in your query. In this meeting, all questions should be addressed to me as the host or moderator, and I will consolidate all the questions and ask to our speaker. If you have further clarifications, you can raise your hand using the raise your hand option and key in your clarification to the chat box. Or you can also opt to ask your follow-up question via voice. Just don't worry, I can unmute you on that part. Just be sure that you have your mic with you turned on. 
for our program details, the session will run for 45 minutes to one hour, and you can send your questions to the Q&A box as, it's, as it arises from your head. Lastly, please check your email for the email follow-up to be sent by the Cisco WebEx Event Center. So that's it. Let's go to our um, speaker for this evening. Our speaker is an experienced multi-skilled healthcare and health e-health industry consultant, physician, and medical informatician. He is the president of Health Futures Incorporation, an independent healthcare and health IT consulting company, which she founded in 1997. She received in 2008 the Canada Health Infoway Standards Collaborative Peer Recognition Award in, rec in recognition of her outstanding contribution, contribution to health information standards development and implementation in Canada and internationally. She is also a certified professional in healthcare and information management systems in U.S. and in Canada. Please welcome our speaker for this evening in the Philippines, Marion Liver. Hi, Marion. Hello. Hopefully you can still hear me. Yes, very well. We are now transferring the protocol to you as presenter. You have the option to show your desktop. Okay. Or load your, your, your files. Participants are still coming in our meeting room. We are now 24, but we started with 14, so our participants are increasing. Trying to get my desktop working here. Uh -huh. um, it's arriving on our screen, and we hope our participants can see it now. Um, by the way, Dr. Alvin Marcello, our chair for the Asia eHealth Information, is in our meeting room. So um, thank you for being with us this evening. So I think we're ready. Can everybody see this? Yes, we can see it now. Wonderful. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining this evening. I know it's late in the Philippines. It's 7 a.m. here in Canada, which is where I'm located. So if I hear any children or dogs, don't worry. <laughs> it's not a distraction. Um, so I've got a lot of slides, but I'm not going to go through. Uh, I'm going to go through some of these quickly, um, and these are for uh, other presentations. So uh, just to let you know a bit more about me, I actually uh, was leading this work item with ISO uh, when I was the convener or chair for the working group there that was developing this, as well as a lead with the Public Health Task Force, uh, which ultimately picked this work item up and finished it. Uh, just a quick slide on the importance of information. Uh, there's no healthcare without management and no management without information. Uh, this is from one of our public health specialists out of Brazil, but I think it's a pretty important uh, commentary on uh, really what we're all trying to achieve with respect to our networks and our e-health activities. Uh, quickly, the overview, I'm just going to talk about the background, how we got to this document, um, what was kind of driving it and purpose objectives, um, some of the concurrent things that were going on, still going on, and how we developed it and the content, some of the challenges and what we expect that's good to come out the other end and how we might promote and disseminate this and obviously some questions and answers. Uh, just a quick background, uh, ISO TC215 is Technical Committee on Health Informatics at ISO. It's about 15 years old. We've published about 120 standards. And the scope's pretty broad. Uh, facilitate the creation, interchange, and use of health-related data information and knowledge to support and enable all aspects of the health system. And the scope for that obviously includes pretty well everything in terms of delivery, prevention, public health, and, and research. Uh, this particular uh, work item came forward from Brazil and WHO uh, back in 2009, Brazil, because they wanted some guidance and framework around implementing their systems nationally, and WHO because they wanted to put some, um, they wanted a concrete document that reflects the goals of the health metrics network, and those core goals really are around uh, focusing on the entire health information and statistical systems for a country rather than just specific diseases, which is usually the case and also um, focusing on the country leadership uh, in organizing uh, health information systems and production of information. Uh, so this was a way for WHO to sort of put teeth into, into that, uh, those goals. 
Uh, the group met initially in Bellagio, Italy, under Rockefeller sponsorship hosted by WHO. We did have developing countries, uh, as you can see on the slide, uh, participating, as well as a lot of the developed countries, um, including Canada and Australia, U.S., etc. And we had some experts from Jambi, who was out of Africa. Uh, the group in Bellagio built actually on the Bellagio meetings from 2008, um, which making the eHealth connection and call for action. There was 200 global leaders there. And really they were talking about collaborating, coordinating, um, and knowledge sharing and capacity building and getting interoperability. Uh, and I've just given you a link there to the document from that um, session. This is lovely Bellagio, which unfortunately I had to miss. <laughs> Many people may be familiar with this location. And this is the group that uh, worked on the uh, initial uh, framework for this uh, from multi-countries. Uh, what was motivating this as well, uh, again, uh, some of these came forward from Brazil and WHO and many other uh, representatives uh, echoed them, really a strong interest in developing your, your systems uh, in these countries because of disease outbreaks, the need for monitoring and improving the general health of the public and individual. A lot of vertical systems existing, um, many of which aren't connected. No, no national e-health policies, um, complex uh, infrastructure that's really underestimated in terms of putting it in place, not enough human resources, lack of knowledge and awareness about standards and accessing uh, these standards and guidelines, lack of advisory and education services, and a no a noticing that existing standards either don't meet your needs or they're presented and made available in ways that you can't use them. So really looking for some single core set of usable standards that encompass the various standards out there to strengthen your own systems and your monitoring and evaluation activities. And the other issue, of course, is you can't afford to purchase standards or um, you know, develop them because it's, uh, they're expensive to do and it's not, they're not freely available in some cases. Uh, we saw this as an urgent activity because there's a lot of duplication of activities going on uh, in various countries, including our own, but uh, in developing countries as well. Um, you know, and there's the Millennium Development Goals is one example, but there's many other goals that people are looking for data to be uh, collected around. And uh, I think these countries also need a, some kind of a framework uh, around how to conceive your system, how to implement it, make your decisions around building or buying systems and uh, acquiring systems and evaluating them. Um, and also you need some guidance in order to be able to support your interoperability and scalability of, uh, of your applications. So what we set out to do is really provide that kind of a framework. Uh, it was targeted to low and middle income countries, but we perceived in the end that it was, a, it was useful for any country um, for their e-health architecture planning and their system planning. And we also wanted to increase uh, LMIC participation by participating in this actual work and in the public health task force uh, as well that was under ISO. Uh, so uh, the objectives, the specific objectives are to set up this model, an e-health architecture model to support the vision from Bellagio uh, 2008 and also 2010. So an architecture that meets the needs for uh, LMIC, it's not proprietary and it's also standards based. And also to provide some direction around uh, selecting standards and by incorporating a maturity model um, and tying that to standards. And we also incorporated the, obviously the HMN and other standards-based frameworks uh, such as SDMX, HD. Uh, and we also wanted to provide some tools, uh, some assistance in, in using this document and there's some of those tools are listed there. I'll briefly touch on, on those as well under concurrent activities. Um, so we had a public health task force which was really looking at the broader initiatives around public health and how that those tie into IT needs. Uh, that task force eventually uh, took over this work item and finished uh, the work on the architecture. That, that group had quite a few countries involved uh, and organizations and, and individual experts. Um, and you can find that information on some of our tools on our wiki. We have a standards knowledge management tool which includes all the definitions and a glossary. Uh, it also includes uh, all the ISO standards and we're loading it with other standards that are available from other organizations. And there's also another resource um, a visualization tool and a resource to actually d drill down into this model and drill down into the standards that are available. I won't get into the details of those on this presentation but we can talk about those uh, in, a, in a different form with more time. 
this is just a quick view of the Public Health Task Force goals and initiatives. Again, they're a broader activity. Their focus was public health, and their, also, their focus was also on um, awareness and promotion and education around standards uh, with a, a various uh, liaison partners such as IMEAN, uh, WHO, and CDC, et cetera. They were very helpful to us in working on this document also. This is our wiki. Uh, we had a wiki set up um, which included these various tools and also allowed us to work on the document, the two documents as we developed them. And it also provided a, it provides a visual uh, of standards and ability to explore the standards that are available that would support this and facilitate use of this tool, use of the frame, architecture framework. This is just a quick picture of our wiki. Uh, it was a collaborative site, as I said. We could work on the documents directly there, and it also housed the SKMT uh, glossary of uh, def terms and definitions and standards and the knowledge resource tool. How we did this, um, it was there was a lot of work, a lot of countries, a lot of meetings, a lot of experts. Uh, we did have some from developing countries. It was a little more difficult for them to participate, given costs and uh, time zones and, and things like that. Um, we did have um, quite a bit of input from uh, many experts that we called to, for specific things in the document. And as I said, the wiki, the wiki facilitated that along with uh, some of the other tools we uh, put in place. It took quite a bit of time to get the second part of this done because of the scope of the work. So what were the outputs? We have two parts. Uh, one was published in 2012, and that was the overview of national initiatives in 2014. Hot off the press, uh, just came out in October. Uh, there's a link here. Uh, I actually put a press release out and put out a brochure about this document and, um, and, and put out their usual general descriptions of the work. And so part two is really the architectural components and the maturity model for the, the roadmap. Um, quickly, for part one, uh, what we did for part one is we really wanted to inform ourselves for part two. Uh, so we had three focus areas, one of which was the health metrics network and, and how that um, fed into this and the importance of the health metrics network. We looked at the contemporary work that was going on in the different countries. What were the national initiatives that were going on in these countries? And we had a mix of, of developed and developing countries, Australia, Brazil, Canada, Kenya, and India. Uh, so we thought that was quite reflective of, of what we wanted to look at in terms of the, the countries and where they might be at. And we also looked at uh, various international m and &E frameworks um, in countries as well as through other organizations. So that gave us a very good idea of the landscape. Uh, these, uh, this document was quite well structured. There was very specific headings for each of the countries and each of the uh, activities we wanted to highlight in each of those countries. So the format for every country was the same and uh, the information provided was quite detailed. But that helped us to drive out the categories for different aspects of the systems that we're interested in and aspects that every country would be interested in in putting together a national um, e-health uh, architecture. And so at, at the end of that document, at the end of that environmental scan, we summarized those key findings and we also proposed the model, um, what we thought would work and how that would be expressed uh, to help countries progress their own initiatives towards maturity. Uh, this is just a quick view of part one, uh, again, from the wiki and how that particular document was divided up uh, for working purposes. Uh, part two uh, was really where the, the meat came into play, and that's where we developed the, the best practice guides uh, for countries in planning and implementing uh, their own systems and to support the delivery of healthcare. There's quite a few annexes attached to the document. This document in total is about 160 pages. A lot of annexes with more details, uh, one of which is a summary of tables uh, indicating recommended and optional standards for use with the, the model and the maturity models. Uh, and also there's an extensive bibliography. Uh, in terms of the standards, just to, to comment, each of the, each of the sections of the document uh, does have a specific subsection which refers to applicable standards, cross-references, and dependencies. Uh, so that's where we set out specifics around the standards applicable to that per, uh, per component um, of the model. The model itself, uh, we presented it in part one, we drove it out in part two, and it really does talk about the components and capabilities that the health authorities can use as a framework for building their own 
uh, architecture. And it does set out a measurement of the maturity of the systems. Um, and we propose three levels, low, medium, and high, and then with examples of the standards, as I mentioned. And we'll talk a bit more about that. Uh, this is really the, the heart of the model. Uh, this was driven out uh, initially in Bellagio and then uh, taken through several iterations after that uh, in terms of what it looked like. Uh, when, where it started and where it ended weren't quite the same. Uh, and what we've done here, and I know you can't see this that well, but um, what we've done here is tagged the various parts of the document to uh, the various parts in this diagram. So you'll see that the help process domain components are in section 5.2 of the document. And those really talk about all the areas of healthcare and healthcare delivery that we're talking about and the path the patient actually walks. And underlying all of those obviously is planning, monitoring, and evaluation uh, relative to the data generated in those encounters. Uh, the middle part is your info structure. This is really the piece that allows the interoperability to happen and the sharing to happen, as well as aggregation of data uh, and uh, where coding and standards are also um, attached. And of course, your core pieces such as your privacy and security and your consent and access controls and your other repositories, um, including your client and provider registries and any other registries you might be putting into place. The bottom part is your infrastructure. Those are your, your nuts and bolts, your, your key pieces, your equipment, your facilities, your infrastructure, your network, those kinds of things that you need to get all this to work. And obviously underlying, uh, underlined by standards, methods, guidelines, and frameworks. Uh, I believe those are actually applicable across the model. So uh, that was something we talked about after the fact and possibly a future change. But for, the, for this model, we put it right in here in the infrastructure because that's at the baseline and that's core to what we're really uh, talking about. Um, more critical, I think, and important, uh, certainly in all our countries, is the governance and national ownership, uh, which we run in a vertical uh, parallel to all of these uh, other components that are in the horizontal frame. Uh, and those uh, took quite a while to get driven out um, because of the nature of what we were asking and because of the need for really good experts to develop those components. Uh, we, went, we took our time to get those things done. So executive sponsorship, so important. If you don't have a sponsor for those, these national initiatives, they're going to fall apart. Uh, and a sponsor that's going to stay in the game <laughs> for the long run and have a, a stable source of funding. The leadership, uh, who's leading the initiatives, uh, national leadership of the program, uh, you know, uh, standards adoption and implementation focus, um, you know, the standards piece again is really critically important and you'll notice in part one uh, the various organizations and entities that countries put in place to get that part of it um, underway and get it uh, implemented and have on an ongoing basis maintained. Uh, capacity, capability and capacity, developing your capability and your capacity, uh, those really refer to your human resources and your skill sets and um, what they need and what, how many of them you need. So there's the pool of your resources and uh, managing your pool and, and expanding your pool, in other words, your capacity, and then the capability and the skill sets those people need at various levels of, um, uh, of informatics to ensure the system is going to work the way you want it to work. Financing and performance management, obviously critical. Uh, no money, no system. Uh, over the long term, you need to, to, to financially manage your system and you need to understand how it's performing and work to improve it. And of course, uh, planning and architecture maintenance. Um, you know, what is the architecture? How is it planned? How are you maintaining it? And we have very uh, specific and uh, fairly detailed sections in this document about all of these uh, items, these six areas that are in this box under governance and national ownership. Um, we felt it was pretty uh, critically important that, that those parts of the document be, be useful and elaborated for, uh, for everybody's benefit. Uh, not to say the other components aren't elaborated uh, well as uh, also, but uh, we thought these are pretty, pretty critical on the, on the far right here. At the top, you'll see what we expect essentially as the output to the outcome for this. Informed policy, improved access, evidence-based practice, informed health service planning, 
better efficiency, productivity, and cost effectiveness, and overall improved quality of care, not just for individuals, uh, but for populations as well. Um, I'll stop there in case anyone has some specific questions at that, this point. Okay. So there's a yes? question here, too, from, uh, we have two questions. Okay. Um, from John Posterilla, will this ISO standard be an auditable one once finalized? If not, are there movements in creating standards specific to companies on health informatics management systems as an auditable standard? Uh, we've talked about uh, the idea of auditing this, and I think that comes back to um, indicators and what we might want to audit relative to uh, what we've proposed here. And that's been discussed in the context of additional work or work items. I think certainly uh, at this point, and we haven't done that piece yet, and that, certainly that was discussed as to, okay, we have this framework, we have, we're going to put it out there for people to use, uh, but how do we go about doing the, the audit component of it? So certainly um, there is additional work that can be done related to that if we want an international standard, and uh, that is something that is being discussed at ISO. But if you take this as, as it is, um, there's also an example proposed within the document at the end which kind of looks at how you might want to go about looking at using this tool. And uh, I, I think that the countries themselves um, may want to look at how best to position this and how they can go about using it and, and setting up, uh, you know, some type of an audit or evaluation. Uh, I, I think that we're not preventing countries from doing that, and uh, again, that might lead to uh, some additional uh, input to a work item that's internationally focused uh, around audit, but certainly countries themselves can take this and start looking at how they might want to use it. All right, at least it's one of the work items that were um, identified. Next question is, how different is this document from the elements of the information security management system as an auditable standard? I think it's a follow-up. Um, I can't speak to that directly because I have to sit down and do that kind of comparison. Um, so I, I think what we tried to do was actually when we were developing the various components, uh, the experts themselves actually leveraged existing standards and um, referenced existing standards as well. So, you know, in the area of security and uh, privacy and consent, for instance, the, the people working on that um, uh, had their own, had their expertise in those areas and clearly they would, um, were leveraging their, their own knowledge and experience as well as their knowledge of existing standards. And you'll find that those standards relevant to those boxes that are in the diagram here, uh, you'll find that those are indicated in the, uh, the technical report itself. In this consent section, there is reference to the specific standards. Similarly, in privacy and security, there is reference to specific standards. Um, so, you know, they're, they're all tied together and an, or an effort's been made to tie them together. We're not saying it's perfect. We're not saying we've captured everything. Uh, certainly, we, we probably haven't got everything that probably needs to be mentioned. Um, and so what we need to do is get this out there and get people using it and to identify where there may be gaps and, and where there may be additional work to be done. All right. At the, um, at the work is uh, really uh, becoming great because there are existing standards that are being tied together. And it's um, really great to know that um, these are being uh, put together from what has been out there. And the last question I have here is from Derek Ritz. Is TR4639 Part 2 available from WHO at no cost? <laughs> yeah, I figured somebody was going to ask that question. <laughs> Uh, not at this point, and I actually talk about that towards the end of the slide deck, but, uh, you know, we can pick up these things here. Uh, we went through several discussions with ISO about making the, these TRs freely available. Um, and, you know, the ISO model uh, that currently exists uh, doesn't make that possible, but we haven't given up um, approaching them about this because we do know that there are certain standards out of ISO that are freely available. And so the view is that 
if we can get this document out there and have people look at it and understand what it's about and, and identify its utility, I think we can go back and make our case again to, that this should be freely available. But no, at this point it's not freely available. In fact, it's published on the ISO site and the current cost of it was listed in francs, uh, Swiss francs at 178 Swiss francs, which is $200 Canadian. Um, which is not a cheap price, but again, there's ways at the national level potentially for a country to adopt this and pick it up and uh, make it available at a national level. Uh, I think Sweden or some of the Netherlands, uh, those countries in Europe have actually undertaken a national process whereby they actually make relevant standards available to everyone that needs them. Uh, in their country. Uh, so that, those are uh, other considerations. Um, again, I've talked about that a bit further on in the document in terms of promotion and dissemination. The short answer is no. <laughs> okay, that's a clear no. Um, just uh, would like to uh, read some chat from our box. Um, information security management system is just one component of this PR and it's under 5.3 EHS infrastructure. I, I think that's a, a comment on the previous question. We don't have yeah. other questions. I think we can move on. Thanks, Marian. Okay, great. Um, I'm just quickly going to show uh, a few examples, uh, just one example actually of low capacity, low, medium, high capacity. And this was an example that uh, came out of Rwanda uh, in the earlier days of putting this together, in fact. Um, and again, we can argue about what the low capacity might actually mean, but again, we've elaborated what low capacity is relevant to each part of the document uh, so that in each section you will see what we've identified for low capacity capacity relative to that component. Uh, in this case, uh, we've kind of got an aggregate here in terms of low capacity means more aggregate data, more focus on M&E, uh, some of the surveillance and vital statistics, and basically there's either isolated clinical systems uh, or there's no real clinical systems as we probably refer to them in, uh, in the North American Western context. And this is an example, um, and I apologize, this was an earlier version of the model, but it's just to show that if you're in a low capacity um, um, state, uh, you're only really focusing on very specific health process domains, uh, such as primary care community, public health, and you really don't have much uh, in the way of uh, the infrastructure. You've got some data interchange um, uh, interoperability and accessibility at some level, and, and this is probably not at a level, certainly we're, you know, uh, we're talking about a major system. Uh, and you've got a questionable how much you've got in place down here in the, in, in the actual infrastructure, but you've got some level of infrastructure across these. Uh, and applicable standards, again, go back to what you're trying to achieve. And if you're looking at, uh, as I mentioned, monitoring, evaluation, vital statistics, surveillance, you're looking at this, uh, this set of uh, standards as a set of example standards that would be applicable uh, for that, those requirements. Median capacity, uh, you're moving on up a bit. You've got some fragmented, uh, you've got some individual data, but you've got a mix of aggregate and, and individual. And you're starting to develop some type of a, an enterprise architecture uh, in, your, in your country. Um, that kind of moves us along in the Rwanda model into uh, these additional components, additional domain components uh, as well. So these are getting added into the system based on what the country deems I think is, is relevant to where they need to go next to achieve what they want to achieve. And a higher capacity, uh, you've then moved uh, into, uh, you know, a clinical data warehouse. You've got your registries. Uh, you've got clinical and summary systems that are interoperating at some level. And you've got some uh, common terminologies and this approach is more, more patient-centered or should be more patient-centered. Not that we've all achieved that, by, not by far in our own developing countries either. So we're also working on achieving the ideal high capacity. And that brings into play everything that's in the model, uh, obviously. 
Uh, this is intended to complement existing frameworks like the HN Health Metrics Network, and you can link across these to um, you know see what kind of standards you're trying to achieve. This is just an example of patient identity, uh, individual identity standards, uh, just just for uh, illustration purposes. And obviously, uh, we want to be able to use this with the tools uh, that are still in development, unfortunately. Uh, these I don't think we've fully realized, and um, the status of, of these tools, uh, I think, uh, is something we're still discussing at, at ISO and other levels. But the idea here is that you can actually use these tools to find standards, identify standards, documents uh, that are relevant uh, to uh, the area of interest. Uh, again, this is the spider representation of the actual um, health, health architecture model of the house. The Parthenon that was being referred to um, in uh, the early meetings, but they, this is a, a different representation of what's uh, encompassed in that capacity-based uh, health architecture model. And this is a drill down on a particular cluster of standards um, for uh, technology standards. And you can, you can find different types of standards using this uh, visualization tool. And the idea is you can actually find what you're looking for <laughs> on drilling down using these tools. Um, again, we can spend some more time talking about those uh, in a different form, um, but I'll, I'll just move on for now as I'm conscious of the time. Our expectation around this is that this is going to be a valuable resource, we hope it is, to plan and provision your, your services uh, and your information resources, your policies, uh, your architecture, uh, and implementing your systems for your information gathering. And it's not just targeted to the systems developers, but it can also be used by uh, academics, researchers, students, uh, anyone who is involved in these types of initiatives. Uh, we had a lot of challenges and <laughs> issues developing the document for one of, our, one of our big challenges was really getting people to freely contribute their time to authoring the components. Uh, that was a big battle. Um, and so it took a lot of time to, to get the project done for part two. You'll notice it was two years from part one, was published in 2012, part two was published in 2014, so two years later. Um, but it really was uh, an effort to get the right experts and get them to be able to contribute what, what we needed from them and to send things back and forth to them when we wanted more elaboration, we wanted more information, we wanted more detail. Uh, or more clarity, so that was really a challenge. And, and getting some of the low-income countries engaged and involved in the work was also a challenge. Um, and, and a bigger job for me, who was the editor-in-chief <laughs> of this document, as well as an author, was uh, harmonizing the language, really, to express the ideas and the concepts in a way that's consistent and comprehensive and rational. Because uh, one uh, expert would contribute their information, but it would really be tied to their country, and it would be very specific to their world. Uh, so we really had to kind of push back on the experts and say, look, we're, we're trying to come up with something that's internationally applicable here, can be internationally used, and that people will understand when they read it and that they can relate to the content um, when they read it. So that was a big job in terms of harmonizing it and getting the document to flow uh, across um, you know, the various sections. The value proposition, um, you know, that there's some challenges there. Obviously, we don't have all the tools evolved or developed and, um, you know, getting support for that continued work on those tools through ISO or other uh, avenues. Aligning, uh, alignment of this work with what's going on currently in the country, such as, uh, you know, in the health, Asian Health Information Network, uh, how does this align with your work and what you've already got underway? And I know talking to Alvin earlier that there's, um, that this seems to be fairly complementary to some of the work that's already underway through your network, um, which, which is great to know and uh, useful to look at um, where this will fit in. Um, I think some of the recommended standards uh, relative to the various components probably need to be driven out further and tied to some specific business processes. And, and we were talking about this at the last ISO meeting, ISO meeting. What we really need is kind of like a business map. So if you've got something like biosurveillance, and um, biosurveillance is an, act, is an activity um, you know, within this framework, what happens in biosurveillance? What are the processes? And then what are the standards uh, that are tagged to each part of the, that overall biosurveillance activity? Uh, so I think, think some additional work needs to be done around that, which ISO is in the process of tackling. 
uh, and we're trying to put, impose some direction and some um, <laughs> some framework around that so that the output at the other end of it isn't something that's useless, it's useful uh, to the various countries. I think some of the maturity models need more elaboration. Uh, again, that was really related to the expertise available. And I think that can happen through actual real world use and application of the, the, the work that's in the, in the document. Um, accelerating the uptake of the standards, uh, Derek already mentioned uh, this is not freely available. ISO still has a for-profit model, and so we're still working on that. Uh, so we're also looking at other ways to, to get this out there uh, for the countries in general. The benefits we already talked about, these are really articulated, as I mentioned, at the top of the roof of the, the e-health uh, architecture model. Um, expected outcomes, I think we all know what we're looking for, <laughs> to have everyone get the right information in the right place at the right time to make their decisions, whatever they might be. Uh, being able to use the information to improve your services in a cost-effective way and being able to produce harmonized, consistent, accessible information so that everybody can use it for the intended purpose. And we wanted to support, obviously, evidence-based practice, quality, planning, safety, and, and all of those good things. Uh, the current mode of promotion and dissemination for this, uh, these two documents anyway, is I did put a press release out, which I don't often do. Uh, and they put a brochure out as well, uh, highlighting the key points of the, these documents. Um, again, they don't often do that either, uh, uh, but both of those are free, obviously. Um, but the purchase price is still high, in my, in my opinion, so uh, that's an issue. Uh, so we're looking to have country-level uh, standards organizations possibly look at, you know, what kind of a purchase model might make sense for them, um, possibly similar to what Sweden has done or other countries. Uh, EMEA has agreed to promote these uh, out to LMICs and also um, I think the existing health information networks uh, at whatever level they're at in these countries uh, can promote, help promote um, and facilitate the uptake and use as well. We have to get more creative, I guess, around uh, getting this stuff out there uh, just because of the cost, I think. We made some more proposals around this activity um, as well that's, I think, relevant. Um, I think that WHO and NGOs uh, and, uh, sorry, the donors and NGOs, I think, really need some help in um, guidance around, you know, getting the standards out there and coordinating activity around standards. And I think that help needs to come from the WHO, ISO, and the Joint Initiative Council, which is a, a group of uh, international SDOs that function under the banner of ISO. Um, because if they don't really understand what this is about, they don't understand the value um, of the, these standards in capturing and collecting, transmitting data, they're, they're not going to promote it. They're going to spend their money on something else. They're going to spend their time on something else. So uh, I think if we can give them some guidance, then they can help the countries in setting up uh, some better infrastructure and support for standards development and standards use. Um, we also obviously support um, you know, the making these available freely. You know, there's the Roads Initiative, and there's also the WHO Hanari program um, for um, sorry, the Hanari program for making things freely available. Uh, so there are some models already that uh, can be pursued, and we we think I, uh, WHO actually should set up uh, some kind of a secretary for coordinating standards activities, uh, particularly in uh, low-income countries. Whether any of these are going to happen, uh, they're still being promoted and discussed uh, through ISO and the Joint Initiative Council, and I think there may be some activity related to the current proposal around um, this, the business map uh, or the master map of standards, as we're calling it, at uh, ISO at the last meeting that uh, this was discussed as an initiative that was actually supported through resolution. I think I'll stop there. I have no idea what time it is. <laughs> Okay, it's, uh, we still have uh, 20 minutes left, I think, for our Q&A session. We have a couple of questions from Sri Lanka, Indonesia, Philippines, and Maldives. For Sri Lanka, the question is, this question is from Jayatri Vijayaratne. Would there be programs to help establish ISO standards for low-income countries? Currently, I think uh, those initiatives are really based at the country level. Um, you know, ISO itself, 
we've been banging on this one for a while and over the last two, three years as, this as these documents developed and especially part two evolved, uh, we, we started talking about, um, you know, making these uh, available uh, and having information and education uh, made available uh, around the, not just the ISO standards but other standards, but ISO in particular because ISO is not really available. Uh, and we've done some talking about that as well uh, at, at the JIC. So there's a lot of talk and uh, less action. Uh, so at this stage, uh, I think we're still in the talk and under development uh, you know, phase. But I, I think if some of the countries come forward and, and make those kinds of requests to these organizations, I, I think we have to get to the, the, the J, things, entities like the Joint Initiative Council, which has got, I think, seven different standards development organizations sitting on there right now. Uh, and we need to get the word coming forward to, from the countries that need this, that, look, this is what we need, folks. This is what we need to put, have put in place. Who, who should undertake it and who can work together to achieve it? And I think that's, that's really what we've been, um, those of us working that have worked on these documents have been hammering on. Uh, and we've got some support, again, from countries uh, like Brazil and Mexico and others who are at the ISO table and who understand the issues. And so we're still pushing it and we're, and we're still pushing it forward. And we've also got some good support from some of the European countries around this. So we're, we're continuing our activities and we're continuing to, to work on and getting there. Right, um, that's a very good agenda, most especially that the Asia eHealth Information Network is having their, our general meeting this December. This is a very good agenda for everyone to raise because it's really the countries who need to uh, raise this issue to other countries as well and saying that we need this and we need to push this forward. All right, we go to our next question. Um, from uh, Melissa Chu, how do we put this across in a way there's it, there in a way where it's not deemed as a burden by the user? For an instance, not another tool to be implemented and then be audited. Well, I, I think the intention is um, certainly not to burden the user, but I mean you could actually burden yourself <laughs> if you want to, depending on how you go about approaching it and looking at it. But uh, I, I think it requires a, a thoughtful approach in terms of you know let, let's look at this framework, let's look at what it's saying, and um, you know as, as an initial start and see whether it encompasses what we think it should encompass, <coughs> and then you can start looking at it from the perspective of, of uh, an initial scan maybe on where your country might fit uh, in regard to, to what's there. Or, or you can take it by components. Um, you know, again, depending on where, where you perceive your country to be, you can start looking at it in, in, in each of those sections that were identified in the model. Um, if, we, if we go back to this framework, I'm, I'm just going to use the, the, the model itself if I ever get back there. Yeah, um, you, you can start looking at it in terms of the component parts um, that are identified in there, you know, the green, the yellow, the blue, the, and the brown. And <clears throat> I think, you know, I think most people tend to focus on, well, you know, uh, and that's what you've been uh, expected to focus on just because of the monitoring and evaluation focus and the expectations from, uh, you know, WHO and Millennium Development and, and other goals. Uh, is to just look at, well, how can I get the data out of the, you know, the, the primary care sector, for instance, um, without kind of looking at, well, what do I really need in place to try and move everything forward in a, in a sensible way? And, and I think some of that starts really with the right-hand side of the model, the governance and national ownership. Um, you know, what, where am I lacking and where am I falling down in, in those particular areas? Because if those things aren't working well and they're not coordinated and organized, then the other parts aren't going to fall into place um, the way you'd like them to or the way they should to, should fall into place. Uh, so I think a good place to start really is, you know, your governance and your national ownership and um, where you uh, see yourself within uh, you know, th those discussions and, and what's being recommended and the advice that's given in those sections. As I mentioned earlier, those, those are very good sections of the document and I, I think uh, will really provide a help to countries to, to further move into the model from there. 
There's a comment here from Derek Ritz. Um, there are multiple donor-funded profiling initiatives underway focused on LMIC requirements. These are being undertaken by IHE, a JIC member. These profile re profiles reference underlying standards and are free. Which is an additional comment. Uh, we have more time to ad address um, three more questions. Um, oh, if I can just comment, if I can just comment, Ali, on Derek's comment. Um, yeah, I'm aware of what IHE is doing, but I, I think IHE certainly referenced in, in many of the applicable standards that are brought forward in this in this document, in this model, and and I think. Um, you know, IHE could actually play a helpful part in, um, with, in terms of where they see this model and where they see themselves fitting in it um, as one of the standards development organizations. Um, so it's, it's great that they're making that available free and those can very nicely fit into the model uh, in terms of uh, the standards that they're producing. So that's a good thing. <laughs> Okay, um, more questions to be asked um, doc, from Dr. Alvin Marcella. How can we make the standards more accessible to developing countries? Should governments be the ones procuring it for, the na for national use? Well, I think, again, there's, there's different models. I mean, obviously, some of the standards development organizations have their standards freely available. Uh, they might not be available in the, the format or the, the, the representation that is, is as useful as we'd like, um, but some of them are freely available. Uh, I mean, I think the big issue we have is, is, ISO's, is ISO's business model. And I think part of the uh, discussion and the initiatives that we talked about at the last meeting um, just recently in Berlin uh, about a month ago was this master map of standards, which is um, really the idea of, of creating that, that mapping of a particular uh, business processes and where the standards fit. Uh, that doesn't make the ISO standards freely available still, um, but it does support making them uh, freely available. Uh, so we're still stuck at that juncture where, um, you know, of, with ISO's business model. Uh, I think some countries have basically said, look, you know, uh, we need to make these available. Uh, this makes common sense. And uh, we, we're going to make them available at a national level through a national government uh, initiative and a national standards um, unit or department under under the national government. So uh, that's great if you've got a country that's got the money. But uh, again, if you talk to someone uh, like Gunnar Klein from Sweden, who's uh, on our ISO committee, uh, he the cost he identified for them to make these standards available in their country was actually not that. Um, and there was some work done around the costing uh, components of this and, and what it might cost uh, a document that Gunnar produced. And I don't know whether that's uh, available for uh, discussion or, or public sharing, but I'll talk to Gunnar further about that because he actually did some good work um, on identifying the costs and identifying the issues around making these standards available. I'll bring that back. All right. Um, from uh, the Ministry of Health in Maldives, Director Athika is asking, how can a, na a nation work it out to implement such a framework within a short period of time to achieve high capacity level? Uh, well, uh, we didn't say this would be short. <laughs> Uh, you know, the time frame really depends on your starting point and, um, you know, uh, what your overall strategy is. Uh, I, I think the, the key parts of this framework are really to, um, you know, just understand what, what's in here and understand where, how that applies in your country. Um, it's, it's not something, I mean, um, the, the timeline is it's an interesting question because uh, we didn't actually attach a timeline to implementing or a timeline to getting to high capacity. And, and everyone's uh, ability to get to high capacity is going to be determined by a lot of things and largely by, I go back to the right side of the diagram, uh, what you've done around your governance and your national ownership. Uh, I think that's going to be a driver of, of uh, how you achieve um, high capacity, how you get to there, and how quickly or not it might take to, to get there. Uh, so I, again, it's, I think that right side is critically important in, in answering that particular question.
right. We have five more minutes to answer two more questions. This is a question from the Ministry of Health in Malaysia, Director Pazela. Can countries use the framework to guide their own e-health architecture? Is this on public domain? Uh, they certainly can, and uh, and I would say that you'll probably find iterations of this document <laughs> public places. <laughs> you didn't hear that from me, of course, uh, and probably Alvin has a has a version of this as well, uh, and he probably has uh, the pre-publication version of it. And if he doesn't, uh, I'll just check my email on that. But um, yeah, I mean, certainly there's a lot of uh, this material available. Uh, it's on the wiki, uh, wiki.org. Um, you know, the, the early earlier development uh, components of it. And so a lot of it's actually out there. The thing about the architecture itself, if you're just looking at the architectural components, uh, a lot of that was really driven out of uh, work that was done on HESA, the Health Information Services Architecture, which is a published ISO standard three-part, and other architecture frameworks. Uh, so the architecture work uh, that was done on this was actually done by one of our experts out of Italy, primarily. And he was heavily involved in the SEN work uh, and the ISO work around uh, other architecture standards that have been published, either out of SEN or out of ISO. Now, I think, I think the SEN standards uh, are, are available, uh, probably um, publicly. But don't quote me on that, because the SEN people will probably hammer me if, <laughs> if I'm wrong. But uh, so a lot of that work was, a lot of the ISO standards works, particularly focused on architecture, were driven out of SEN work initially. Uh, and a lot of that's available too. So we, we certainly didn't, we didn't dream up a new architecture. What we did was uh, we framed it in a way and um, you know, put it forward in such a way that it brings in or wraps in those other architectural uh, standards uh, that were done and presents it in a way that's, I think, more usable, uh, at least in my view. Um, you know, again, you, the users themselves who take this document and, and start to look at it can, uh, would, would answer that question once you've had an opportunity. But that's my view of how we've, uh, how we've done that work. So. So that's a long answer to say, yes, you can find a lot of this, <laughs> and uh, you, you can find it in various places. But um, like I said, I think Alvin may have the pre-publication version of this document as well. Or, or he will have it. We can, maybe they can uh, find it um, in public domain, and maybe Ahin could provide this resource to them after this webinar. Um, two more questions before we end um, from Roberto Patio. Given that infrastructure and financial capacity is a big factor in the standard to leverage the cost, does ISO create a partnership in terms of equipment acquisition? Uh, no, not that I'm aware of. Um, again, don't quote me on that, but uh, the ISO business model really is reflected um, in its, it sells its standards and um, it's, um, you know, it's got many other uh, technical committees um, in the overall ISO organization. And you can probably understand that the majority of the standards or many of the standards they produce are targeted to companies that purchase them because they have to conform to standard X. They have to conform to standard Y. So uh, they sell them. Uh, so their model really is based on selling the standards that are developed and they know that organizations and countries, whatever the entity is, has to buy them. And um, they, um, so they have no issue selling them. Uh, so it, it's the model works. For something like this and for something like these types of standards, uh, I think it's an issue. And so we're trying to get that recognized as an issue. And we're still working on it. <laughs> So last questions before we end. There are some questions, but I think it would be um, good to send it to you and you just um, email it to us your response to that question and we'll just um, email it to all our participants. Our last question is in each box of in each of the boxes on the TR will take time to to mature. Which boxes are mandatory in the skeleton that you have provided earlier of the whole national e health program? Example, executive sponsorship is mandatory. What might be others? Uh, I think the way we position this is um, like we position this as these are all key components of uh, the architecture 
model that you want to put in place, right? So we haven't tagged the word mandatory to any specific components. What we've done is uh, we've taken the experience from part one, um, and when we went through part one, uh, we've taken the experiences of the countries, and we had examples of countries that are really obviously at high capacity, or what we would refer to as high capacity, and obviously countries that are not there. They're either at low capacity or they're trying to strive for medium uh, capacity. And what we did was we pulled everything out um, from the initial environmental scan and identified what was what were key components. Um, so we didn't specifically tag mandatory or optional to those components. We think that all of these components are important. Uh, all of these are important to achieving a successful uh, national uh, health information system. Uh, whether you tag a priority to them, uh, you know, is another question. But we, we we're saying they're all important in terms of the overall goals that you're striving for. Uh, we we try to stay away from mandatory, optional, desirable, or any of those phrases because they may be interpreted in different ways by different people. So I think you need to look at it as a whole, and then look at each of those. Components components and say, well, what do I need in my country uh, to, to achieve, you know, uh, an executive sponsorship that makes sense, that's going to support my initiatives and going to help me move forward. So that just as an example, right? Uh, and we found that in part one, if you don't have an executive sponsor uh, to support these initiatives, uh, then you're either going to have a failed initiative or you're going to have an initiative that doesn't really meet your needs. Um, so all of that to say that whatever we put in, in that framework, we deem to be of importance, right, uh, to achieving your goals. Okay, so it's 9.02 p.m. Thank you so much for addressing our question. But um, our participant is requesting the slide, so um, sure. would you be able to send us a slide and I would just send it to you? Yeah, no, I'll send that to, uh, I'll send these along to you and to uh, Alvin and uh, hopefully um, uh, you can post them wherever you need to post them. Okay, so we will just uh, send uh, the the slides to the attendees, attendees of this meeting. Thank you very much. For those who attended this session, we have our participants from the Ministry of Health in, in uh, Myanmar, in uh, Maldives, in uh, Bangladesh, and the Department of Health of the Philippines by Mrs. Thelma Pulong. We also have participants from the Ministry of Health in Bangladesh and some academic university academic units such as the Seoul University, Taipei Medical University, um, Dian Luswan Toro University from Indonesia. Uh, we also have from Regis Strait. Thank you so much. I will send a summary of those who attended uh, this meeting for the countries who we have in this meeting. Thank you for being with us and uh, we'll see each other for our next Asian Hour on November 28th. Have a good night, everyone from the Philippines. Thank you, Martin, uh, for sharing your time. I hope to meet some of you folks or many of you folks at the meeting in Manila. Right, right, because we will have, be having our general meeting in December 4 and 5. Thank you. Okay, thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.